Ilmater is a deity who is selfless and unfaltering in his devotion and service to others who find themselves in need. No pain is too great and no task too daunting to endure as the broken god does all while smiling. His clergy espouse and live out the goals of their patron deity, becoming beloved by the needy of Faerun. I'm Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. Titles Ilmater goes by the following titles. The Crying God, The Lord on the Rack, The One Who Endures, The Broken God, He Who Endures, and The Rack Broken Lord. Ilmater has two aliases. The first is a Yuruk. He goes by this alias among the Aleutian people of the Great Glacier. The second alias is Itishi Kopak among the Angu Aleutian people of the Great Glacier. Portfolio and Domains Ilmater's portfolios include Suffering, Martyrdom, Endurance, and Perseverance. Ilmater's suggested domain for 5th edition is Life. Appearance and Manifestations Ilmater appears as a bent-over human man injured in several different ways. Smashed hands, broken joints, numerous scars open cuts, burn marks, and showing other marks of torture. He has often been seen and depicted as a short human man with a balding head, hairy body, a comforting face, and wearing nothing save a breech cloth. Ilmater does not wield any weapon of any sort. All damage is taken willingly by Ilmater as he makes no effort to defend himself from it. When he is spurred on by evil committed towards others, however, Ilmater will make use of unarmed strikes, as well as his roster of damage-dealing spells. Ilmater's avatar bears a similar resemblance to himself, hobbling from place to place. It is clear from the avatar that moving about with such injuries is uncomfortable and painful for them, though the avatar always chooses to sport a kindly face. Ilmater can manifest himself into the body of those who may be suffering in an attempt to divert such suffering instead to himself, though this is only done for those who are good in alignment. When Ilmater possesses someone's body in this way, the body is surrounded by a bright white aura. The individual is healed and begins regenerating hit points as all pain seemingly becomes non-existent. Usually, all torture devices and restraints around the possessed individual are destroyed. Should Ilmater be angered thoroughly by those performing torture, he may even use the possessed person's body as a conduit to cast harmful and destructive spells in retribution. Another known manifestation of Ilmater's is best described as a watchful, invisible presence, though often a howling or whimpering can be heard. Though unseen, Ilmater can speak through his manifestation, move about things telekinetically, and cast spells. Lastly, Ilmater's intent and will may be carried or communicated through the appearance of various creatures or objects, including the various types of angels, Einhariar, Holyfonts, Incarnates of Courage, White Doves, Donkeys, Daisies, white roses, field mice, and sparrows. Abilities Due to his status as an intermediate deity, any check Ilmater makes with a d20 is treated automatically as a result of 20. Any one rolled on a d20 for a save or attack is instead treated as a normal roll instead of the usual assumed failure. Of course, given his deific status, he is immortal and subject to all the different rules associated with destroying and or killing a deity. Ilmater's divine sense extends out to a distance of 13 miles, which is approximately 21 kilometers. This sense can reach out from himself, his worshippers, his holy sites, holy items dedicated or crafted by him, 
or any location in which his name or one of his titles has been spoken within the last hour. What's more is that this divine sense can tap into up to 10 different locations at once. Those of his divine rank or lower can be blocked out at two different locations for up to 13 hours. Ilmater's portfolio sense picks up on any suffering or acts of martyrdom incurring when they happen. Ilmater retains the sense of these events for up to 1310 days, which is equivalent to 130 days. In 3rd edition terms, Ilmater can automatically succeed on any balance or heal check so long as the DC is 25 or lower. That and he can perform up to 10 of these checks as free actions in a given round. Ilmater can create any magic item that heals, reduces suffering, or is generally good and or lawful in nature, so long as that magic item's value does not exceed 200,000 gold pieces. Ilmater's avatar is capable of casting numerous types of magic and spells, though those that do damage are only used should such an evil and sadistic force or individual present themselves or the avatar acts in the defense of others. Healing spells cast by Ilmater's avatar are twice as effective as their normal spells. Though his damage and injured form speaks to the contrary, Ilmater's avatar has inherent regenerative abilities. Regaining all hit point, sorry, regaining hit points each round. What's more is that Ilmater's avatar can easily carry on normal function even while at negative hit points. The avatar is only brought down after a sizable amount of damage has been done well into their negative hit point range. Ilmater will use his fists in battle and is considered a master of unarmed combat. He's capable of several feats related to the monk class, including deflecting missiles. Personal History Ilmater is said to be an older deity in the setting, though his origins are never truly stated. In negative 243 Dale Reckoning, Tyr's actions during the procession of justice attracted Ilmater to Tyr's cause. Some long time after, though an actual number of years is never stated, Torm joined up with Ilmater and Tyr. From that day forward, these three deities would form a trio of lawful good deities that have since gone on to be known as the Triad. In 1384 Dale Reckoning, just before the Spell Plague, Ilmater killed off his alliance with the Triad due to Tyr's slaying of Helm. For a brief period, Ilmater moved his realm of martyrdom to Sunni's Plain of Bright Water. Following the events of the Spell Plague the next year, and Tyr's martyrdom defending a demonic incursion into the House of the Triad, Ilmater would return to help Torm on the Plain of Celestia. Following the events of the Second Sundering, though it is left unsaid, I feel safe in speculating that the Triad has been reformed after Tyr has returned. Personality Ilmater is a lawful good deity, who is a former lesser, now intermediate deity. Ilmater is referred to as the Willing Sufferer. He is patient, calm, collected, kind, and quiet. Ilmater likes a good joke or humorous story and is known for his own form of rustic humor. Ilmater is not entirely passive as his anger can be brought forth if enough pain or injustice is brought to bear on others. Ilmater's bent over and ravaged appearance initially can scare away those who are young but Ilmater makes a point of reassuring them of who he is and his true nature. Personal Realms Before the advent of the World Tree cosmology used in 3rd edition, 1st edition and 2nd edition sources mentioned that Ilmater's realm of Martyr Domain, which has subsequently been renamed to just Martyrdom, was found on the layer of Shurok on the outer plane of Bytopia. Bytopia, which is also called the Twin Paradises, or the Twin Par Paradises of Bytopia, is the lawful good and neutral good plane in between Mount Celestia and Elysium in the Great Wheel. Both layers of Bytopia are made up of rolling hills, tall mountains, and flourishing forests. Compared to the other layer of Bytopia, known as Dothion, Shirok's climate and terrain are far harsher and unforgiving. In other words, a fitting place for a god of endurance and suffering to live. Shurok is abundant in ores, lumber, and other forms of natural resources, 
highly valued in trade. A smaller portion of folks and petitioners live on Sure Rock, but are key in transporting resources down, and I use that term loosely here, to those on Deltheon. If one was to look at Biotopia, you would see Shurok hanging upside down over top of Dothion, or vice versa, depending on which layer you currently stand on. The ground of the other layer can easily be made out up above you. Travel to the other layer can be accomplished by scaling up the tallest mountains on each layer. The peaks of these tall mountains meet one another and form a natural stone column. Though one must pay careful attention when they get to the transition point as the gravity shifts on them, the sky of the plane is shared by both layers and goes through a typical day-night cycle, though there are no celestial bodies to note of this transition. Though it can be said that the stars on Bytopia come from the sources of light visible on their respective layer that hangs up above a given person. The petitioners here are an industrious but kind people. Though any sense of charity is expected to be reciprocated with a work or favor in kind deemed to be equal in value. Adventurers aren't barred from Bytopia, but they aren't exactly treated as well as others given partitioners of Bytopia do not see adventurers as productive individuals. Almost all of the gnomish pantheon calls Bytopia home and the gnomish deities who reside here live on Dothion in the respective realm of the Golden Hills. For this reason, the population of gnomes and gnomish petitioners is far greater than any other peoples on Bytopia. As I will explain when I describe Ilmaner's realm in a 3rd edition and 4th edition cosmology, it is clear that in present day Faerun, I think Ilmaner would reside in the outer plains with Torm and Tyr on Mount Celestia in the Great Wheel. While this isn't accounted for in any 5th edition source as of yet, I feel very safe in making this assumption. Either way, I will cover Mount Celestia here briefly in the Great Wheel. Mount Celestia is the upper plane of good and purity. The mountain is central to this plane, and there are seven layers that ascend up to the summit. Each layer is separated by a level of fog that makes up the sky for that level. Across the mountain are several trails and paths that lead in various directions. In order to ascend up the mountain, Travelers have to find the true path up to the next layer. Such journeys are considered trials to test worshippers. Those worshippers separate from the dwarven halfling and dragon deities who reside on Mount Celestia become Archons when they die. Much like devils, the Archons move through a hierarchy of beings of greater power, though their motivations are more about holy service and good deeds. Which of the seven layers of Mount Celestia Ilmater resides on potentially beats me. He could just as easily be with Torm on the second layer known as Mercuria, or he could be down on the first layer with Tyr, where this layer is known as Lunia, though he certainly does not reside upon the seventh and topmost layer of Cronius, given that layer standing on Mount Celestia. In the great tree cosmological model used in 3rd edition Forgotten Realms, Ilmater resides on the plane known as the House of Triad with Torm and Tyr. This is a plain full of majestic halls and palaces, lit by an ever-present radiance. Law here is more the defining characteristic rather than good, given the presence of the other lawful neutral deities here with the lawful good deities. Confusingly, there is a mount here called Mount Celestia as well. However, there are three mounds surrounding the mount, where the realms of Ilmater, Tyr, and Torm are built upon each mountain's summit. Ilmater's realm here is known as Martyrdom. Martyrdom has a large open-air temple in the middle of it. In Martyrdom, no pain or fatigue is to be felt. This realm is often regarded as one of the most peaceful and restful realms among all the planes. In the World Axis Cosmological Model in 4th edition, Ilmater's realm of Martyrdom is found on Celestia, where three smaller mountains circle a massive central mountain. One of the smaller mountains is where Ilmater has established his realm of martyrdom. Much like other descriptions of martyrdom, his realm is idyllic and free from pain and suffering. The open-air temple center of the realm is made of rows of white pillars. During the period in which Tyr was deceased, a plinth of stone rested in this temple. Into the stone, Tyr's sword of Justiciar had been plunged, and on the plinth was carved 
justice endures. Allies and Allegiances Ilmeter's chief allies are Torm and his superior Tyr. Together, these three lawful good deities form the Triad. Ilmeter personally sees to guiding the blind Tyr, should the need arise, to travel. While Torm serves as the sword arm of Tyr, Ilmeter serves as the compassionate and understanding other half. Ilmeter's other allies include Ibrandul, who is presently deceased, and Lathander. Enemies Ilmeter's primary nemesis is Loviatar, given Loviatar's sadistic nature, and often their clergies will clash. Ilmeter's other chief enemies include Talona, Malar, Talos, Bane, Baal, Mercule, Garagos, and Shar. Deity and Avatar Stat Blocks The second edition stat block for Ilmeter's avatar can be found in the Face and Avatar supplement. The third edition stat block for Ilmater and his avatar can be found in the Face and Pantheon supplement. Symbols Ilmater has two symbols. The lesser known of the two that has fallen out of favor and is of more historic significance presently is that of a blood-stained torture rack. Ilmater's better known symbol is a crossed pair of white hands bound at the wrist with red cord. This symbol has proven to be far more favorable it is much more popular as a result in comparison to Ilmater's former symbol. Central Dogma From the 3rd edition supplement Faiths and Pantheons Quote Help all who hurt, no matter who they are. The truly holy take on the suffering of others. If you suffer in his name, Ilmater is there to support you. Stick to your cause if it is right, whatever the pain or peril. There is no shame in a meaningful death. Stand up to all tyrants and allow no injustice to go unchallenged. Emphasize the spiritual nature of life over the existence of the material body. End quote. Presence of the Faith Ilmater is a popular deity among the downtrodden, poor, and enslaved throughout Faerun. Though they may suffer now, eventually, so they are taught and believe, Greater things will await them once their trials are seen through. Ilmater has several monks and paladin worshippers as well. Those who worship Ilmater tend towards a lawful good, lawful neutral, or neutral good alignment. In a setting that can be as dangerous as the Forgotten Realms, the Ilmatari faith serves as a bastion of goodwill and reliability for the common people caught in the crossfire. Support for the Ilmatari usually is high throughout Faerun for this very reason. There are those who dislike or despise the Ilmatari faith for their seemingly weak and selfless stance. That and some hold the opinion that the Ilmatari are masochistic. The truth is, is that the Ilmatari are bound to help those who are less fortunate or in dangerous areas, so often they do end up suffering in their own way. To harm a member of the Ilmatari clergy as they go about their duties is viewed to be a taboo in several regions especially when they tend to both sides in a given battle. This extends to other races as well. So long as the Ilmatari attend to their dead and the wounded, even goblinoids and orcs will leave the Ilmatari alone. In Kalim Sham, being violent towards Ilmatari clergy is further warned against. A legend speaks of how a ruler of the Shun Imperium long ago laid a curse across his land. He stated that should anyone do harm to an Ilmatari, that harm would be returned to them 1,000-fold. For this reason in Kalmshan, Ilmatari are allowed to operate openly and whisk away and free slaves who find themselves in this region of Faerun. Ilmater's faith is very prominent and strong in Damara and in Pilter, so much so that some consider the Ilmatari faith to be both regions state religion. Past paladins of Ilmater have ruled from the thrones of both these regions. Another note about Kalmshan is that a chosen of Ilmater named Kirin made their appearance known and started up a resistance movement based on non-violent means. This was in direct opposition to the elemental lords who held many slaves under their rule. The chosen eventually went missing and the slave population rose up in violence. This ended in the deposition of the genie lords as they made their retreat back to their respective elemental planes. 
The whereabouts of this chosen are known, but all, all I will say is that the details of Kirin can be found in the adventure book Tales from the Yawning Portal for 5th edition. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy Depending on which edition source book you go by, the Ilmatari clergy either go collectively by the title of Pain Bears or the Adorned. So choose one or use both at your leisure. Compared to all other good aligned faiths, the Ilmatari faith has an abundance of saints. Notably, these saints are more often than not those who have given themselves up as martyrs in the name and service of Ilmater. Referring to second edition sources, the Ilmatari simply refer to one another as brother or sister, though revered sister or brother is used for senior clergy members. Those of the revered brothers and sisters who run temples and other places of worship may also be referred to as mother or father. The monks of Ilmater usually live apart from the main body of the Ilmatari clergy, though sometimes Ilmatari monks will come to places of worship to perform guard duty, to learn, or to teach. Some especially come to train the Ilmatari clergy to fundamentals of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Regional leadership in the Ilmatari faith revolves around the place of worship with the greatest importance. The head senior clergy member stationed here is whom all clergy members from the surrounding abbeys, temples, shrines, and monasteries in the region report to. For a lawful good faith, their hierarchy is rather informal and lacking in ranks. There is no one true leader of the entire faith. Rather, the regional leaders will sometimes come together at conclaves and discuss internal matters then. Following the time of troubles, a neutrally aligned cult called the Cult of Shared Suffering, said to be dedicated to a meter, emerged. They believed in the sharing of suffering rather than enduring it on their own. This fringe cult engaged in such things as self-flagellation and kidnappings. None of their members received any form of spells from Ilmater, and it is suspected that an evil faith like Sirik, Lovitar, or Bashaba was responsible for its formation. Regardless, it was eventually broken up and removed from Faerun. It has recently come to my attention that the source book titled Ed Greenwood Presents Ilmater's Guide to the Forgotten Realms is not actually a fourth edition source book it just happened to come out at the time fourth edition was the standing edition of dungeons and dragons rather it is intended as a edition neutral source book written by ed greenwood to present his vision of the realms as it is sometimes this book conflicts with the source books across all editions the division of the ilmatari faith in this book is just one of these so-called alternative details the Ilmatari fulfill and are divided into one of three roles with the respective title, Healer, Painbearer, and Sanctar. Healers are stationed in slums and war-torn areas to provide their services. Painbearers travel Faerun as diplomats and counselors as they look to less intentions. Sanctars are specifically called out to be senior members of the clergy who operate in a secretive capacity. They are internal investigators of the Ilmatari faith and operate in a far more martial capacity, punishing those who act against the Ilmatari faith. Paladins of Ilmater are by default Sanctars. A certain group of Sanctars are said to be acting on divine direction from Ilmater to redistribute the wealth of the world to the needy. As such, they act much like a group of Faerunian Robin Hoods. They also place pressure on policy and lawmakers in towns and cities to ensure that those of lesser means are accounted for when such legislation is penned. Responsibilities and Duties of Clergy and Worshippers Places of worship to Ilmater offer a wide range of healing services and aid. No faith in all Faerun holds a candle to the number of trained medical practitioners in the Imultari faith. From the start of their careers as clergy members, initiates are taught medical techniques and knowledge. Some members of the faith are charged daily with going out and gathering and preparing medicinal herbs. Their stockpiling and preparation goes into full swing when any armed conflict seems to be imminent. True to their ethos, Ilmatari clergy are to be selfless in their actions, putting others before themselves. While they may not have institutionalized counseling services, 
Many of their members are trained to counsel those in need. Ilmatari clerics and other clergy are expected and are found in areas that are impoverished, plague-stricken, and or war-torn. Initiates and other newer members in the faith often find it hard to deal with the environments and situations that they place themselves into to provide aid. Older members tend to build up a hardened personality to deal with such trauma. Usually this personality can take on a cynical and sarcastic air. However, they are not true cynics as they still continue to aid the others than themselves who are in need. The Ilmatari also do a lot of work with diseased bodies, preparing them, cleaning them, and burying them. As was alluded to earlier, the Ilmatari faith tends to be well supported from the various corners of Faerun. Clergy members may be tasked with seeking donation and alms throughout the wealthier districts and cities of the continent. Monks in the military faith often act as temple guards or guard traveling clergy members and clerics. Orders and Priestly Bodies The Ilmatari faith has several orders filled with fighters and paladins. The Companions of the Noble Heart are one of the far more militant bodies in the Ilmatari faith. They primarily seek out those who cause others torture and suffering. Unsurprisingly, their greatest foe is the faith of Loviatar. The Order of the Golden Cup is an order whose primary call to action is attending to the sick, poor, and downtrodden. They will seek out and fight evil humanoids and evil creatures, but that is not their initial stance. The Triad has a long history in Impilter. Starting in 729, Del Reckoning the Triad Crusade began when an army dedicated to the Triad traveled to Impilter and started the Fiend Wars against the Scaled Horde. The Impilter throne was seized by King Egrosh the Scaled, and the population was driven into exile. Out of this war, the Order of the Triad was formed to defend against any more fiendish incursions into Impilter. Over the years, this order's strength waned from battles and political strife. In 1196 Dale Reckoning, King Emphris II of Impilter created the Most Holy Order of the Sacred Shrike after interpreting the sight of a shrike killing a small demon as a good omen. The Knights of Emphris II are an elite order of paladins pledged to the crown of Impilter for life. Their formal name is the Most Holy Order of the Sacred, Sacred Shrike, and they are composed solely of paladins in service to one of the Triad. They specialize in hunting down fiends and any threat from ancient Narfel to the northeast. Three lords serve as the triumvirate of the order, each one representing the deities of the triad. They are each given the title of war captain. The day-to-day -day management of the order is carried out by the Council of Shrike Lords, which is a body of 40 paladins and clerics. Each member of the order is considered to be a member of Impilter's standing army, and most of them are recognized as officers. Pockets of the Abyss, known as, known as Demon Sis, are buried beneath in Pilter. In this order are our specialists trained to fight against what fiends may come out of these Sis, and whatever humanoids, cultists, and or creatures align themselves with demons. Joining this order requires an oath of fealty to the Impilter crown, and sponsorship from one of the three faiths of the Triad. Then, the test of the triad must be completed, whereby an individual must confront and or defeat three of Impilter's foes with bravery. The members of the Janissar are worshippers of the triad deities. The Janissar are mounted defenders of the poor and oppressed in Kalmshan. They patrol the roads, taking out slaving caravans, bandits, and highwaymen. They move in small squads of five to six members composed of priests, clerics, fighters, and or paladins. Their true numbers are unknown given the secrecy they attach to themselves and what seems to be their unwillingness to gather in large groups more than twelve. They have secret strongholds in the marching mountains and are led by three elderly priests of each faith who have given up their martial duties. The Knights Koldar of Beric Morden, also known as the Beric Mordana, are a militant group of holy warriors in service to the Triad who live in a fortified abbey on a road between Deromar and Seradush in Tethyr. They have an alliance with the Janissar, but after that have little contact with the other groups associated with the Triad. The Knights aim to heal the sick, help the weak, and avenge those harmed by injustice. This group is far more eclectic than other Triadic groups. The majority of the Knights are worshippers of Torm, though the group is led by a commander from each of the three faiths. Other holy orders of warriors include 
the Holy Warriors of Suffering in Pilter, and the Order of the Lambent Rose, whose location is unknown. The Faith also has several monastic houses, which in turn have their own orders. Typically, the monasteries these orders are trained and housed in bear the name of Flowers. The Disciples of St. Solars the Twice Martyred are based out of the monastery the Yellow Rose in Damara. The monastery itself is found high up in the Earth Spurs mountain range near the glacier of the White Worm. The disciples are well trained in genealogical studies, diplomacy, and insight. Monks from this order often travel with members of the Order of the Golden Cup. This monastery has a unique training method whereby disciples are taught to endure pain specifically by writing atop a remoraz. The Broken Ones are a monastic order charged with the protection of places of worship and the faithful of Ilmatari as they carry out their duties. Some of the other monastic orders of Ilmatari monks include the Followers of the Unhindered Path, the Disciples of St. Morgan the Taciturn, the Sisters of St. Jasper of the Rocks. The Alleviators are an organized group of specialty priests who are trained specifically to teach the suffering how best to cope with their pain. It is their belief that through appropriate coping mechanisms, an individual becomes stronger in the face of the pain they must endure. They have an innate ability that is active so long as they act in the defense of another, whereby they cannot be brought down until the damage to them exceeds their hit point maximum in the negatives. Appearance and Dress Full clergy of Ilmater wear simple grey robes and grey skull caps, though red skull caps are worn by clerge senior clergy members. Novices go without a skull cap of any sort. Clergy members typically wear their holy symbols pinned over top their heart on the outside of the robes or on a chain that hangs around their neck. Typically, they wrap red cord or fabric around their wrists, though some also will do the same around their ankles and feet. Some clergy members have a gray teardrop tattoo on the side of either of their right or left eye. The only significance that I can guess at is either that tattoo is in direct reference and reverence for Ilmater's title as the Crying God, and or it symbolically represents that while older clergy members may be hardened by their experience, they still feel on the inside the pain they come across in the wide world. When adventuring, Ilmatari clergy may wear clothing and armor appropriate to the task, environment, and weather. Though a grey tabard bearing Ilmater symbol is to be worn over top the clothing and or armor they are wearing. The symbol is stitched on the tabard to rest near the left shoulder of the individual. They are almost never seen without medical supplies. Specialty priests known as alleviators wear the same similar grey robes as the rest of the clergy of Ilmater, cinch clothes with a rope as a belt. A leather thong is tied around both wrists. Alleviators are not to wear armor or shields and may only use a quarterstaff as a weapon. Rituals Clerics of Ilmater pray and meditate for their spells in the morning. The Ilmatari clergy are expected to pray to Ilmater six times per day, though it is not stated whether there are any prescribed times to do so, or whether it is just the tally clergy need to note as they go through their day. There are no annual holy days in the Ilmatari faith. An important reprieve that can be called for by any clergy member is known as the plea of rest. A plea of rest allows a clergy member to have a 10-day off from their duties. This allows them to recuperate and even participate in something that otherwise they would not be allowed to do so, given their bounds as a clergy member. Though there is such an extent to the depravity or evil the Ilmatari faith is not willing to turn a blind eye to. Sometimes the plea may be enacted by the clergy to allow some of the members to complete a task that they would otherwise not be permitted to do so given their core beliefs. The turning is an important ritual conducted by clergy members as they attend to someone in palliative care. The clergy member tells the patient to look to Ilmater for comfort as they are passing. By doing so, Ilmater is said to alleviate their pain and discomfort. This is not a manipulative ritual and it attempts for a last-second conversion. Rather, the turning is done solely with the intent to provide relief and comfort. In order to become an initiate into the Ilmatari faith, a candidate must do the following. First, a candidate goes for a walk with a senior clergy member, and they discuss the candidate's personal philosophies. 
Second, and I will admit this does come off as pretty manipulative, the candidate is then invited for dinner. During that dinner, the candidate is served wine that has mind-altering effects that put the candidate at ease and allow clergy and other spellcasters who are worshippers themselves easier access to the true feelings and thoughts of the candidate via scrying spells. Finally, should no falsehoods be discovered, the candidate is presented with the gray robes of the Ilmatari faith. The need for these scrying magics came about from previous false candidates looking only to learn the medical knowledge of the Ilmatari faiths, and or make off with the valuable medical supplies from temple stores. General Locations of Places of Worship Most places of worship to Ilmater are strategically located to act as way stations along major trade routes. More often than not, these temples or churches are named after martyred Ilmatari saints. Generally, they are built to reflect walled manors. Protective outside wall surrounds a chapel or a larger temple, a chapter house, facilities for the sick and injured, stable and garden. Some locations have small libraries, quarters for monks separate from the chapter house where the resident clergy live, and or barracks for an Ilmatari paladin order. Specific Locations of Places of Worship In Thay, Ilmater is favored by the enslaved. Slaves often create mobile shrines to bring about with them. Though it goes unstated, I'm sure the enslaved and they have to do their best to keep any worship of Ilmater hidden. The singular Ilmotari temple in Thay can be found in Byzantur. It is a simple temple building known as Ilmater's Cathedral. Here the enslaved and lower class Thayans come to pray and receive healing. The Red Wizards claim the Ilmotari clergy are helping the free slaves, but those claims have always been yet to be proven. The Black Lion tribe is a former Uthgart tribe settled at Beel Run as well. This tribe did away with the worship of Uthgar and now worship the three triad deities as well as Helm. Ilmater is highly venerated in Kalmshan, especially among the lower class and slaves. For that reason, at a minimum, every Kalashite settlement has a shrine to Ilmater. It is not hard to find various Ilmatari abbeys, hostels, or seminaries outside of Kalashite settlements as well. The House of the Broken God is the largest Ilmatari place of worship. It can be found in Keltar. The massive monastery complex serves as the hub as it sits in the, si in the center of Keltar. From there, Ilmatari clergy are connected to various houses of healing and a temple farm through a series of walled gardens. The cloister of St. Ramadar is located in the southern slopes of Mount Adir in the Starspire mountain range. It is named after a saint who was an advocate of prison reform and was executed and martyred for trying to shield farmers from needless persecution. The cloister is housed in a former dwarven stronghold that has since been converted. Here the Ilmatari seek to rehabilitate to Therian inmates and provide care to the mentally unwell individuals who find themselves at this monastery. The grounds of the cloister contain a chapel, hostel, a handful of storehouses, a library, several cells where priests, patients, and prisoners reside, and finally a young bronze dragon who defends the cloister secretly from the sea caves located down below. Further details about the cloister of St. Ramadar can be found in the second edition supplement Powers and Pantheons. There is a shrine to Ilmater in the Hook Ward of Calimport. Here the small body of clergy look to heal the sick and use their small amounts of funds to free slaves brought into port at the city. Continuing with the long list of places of worship we have located in Kalimshan, there are two Ilmatari monasteries located within the force of Mir. Each of these monasteries is well guarded and fortified against any threats living within the forest. The Hospice of St. Miriam is a hospital and pharmaceutical and herb supplier for the Ilmatari places of worship throughout the Thir and Kalmshan. The Monastery St. Alban houses a rather active body of clergy involved in freeing slaves. Located in the Marching Mountains are three Ilmatari abbeys. They too are rather active in freeing and protecting slaves. St. Phalar's Cloisters is a single building built up on the slopes where Ilmatari monks and rangers train and teach slaves survival skills that will help them to reach lands to the north. The School of St. Rukir is a small religious complex devoted to the craft of stone carving and engineering. Some among their number are dwarven converts. 
St. Dalva's Abbey in Kaoshan is named after a female martyr who was beaten to death by her master. In patriarchal Kaoshan, St. Dalva's is one of a few places where women can come to learn and wield influence. The mostly female clergy espouse equality and coexistence in the face of prevailing views. Two religious houses exist on the slopes of the Alamir Mountains. The Monastery of St. Fanal is a library and training center for scribes and historians. Many of them find work afterwards at well-known places of learning, such as Candlekeep. St. Widdin's Hospice is a healing house that tends to specific patients who have contracted incurable diseases or curses, both mundane, such as leprosy, and magical, such as mummy rot or lycanthropy. There are two monasteries found out in the arid Callum Desert. The Friary of St. Amal is a safe house for traveling nomads and travelers. The clergy here retreat into the heavily shuttered buildings to keep out as much heat and light. The well here reportedly has never run dry. St. Noradnar's Hermitage is a place of training for monks. Here martial art techniques are taught that disarm, disable, or otherwise dismay those from further use of aggressive force. The House of St. Lewin's Blessing is found along the northern coast trail of Kalmshan. It is a religious house that trains its clergy members how to cook in all manners of different styles and methods. St. Sarl's Priory is located just to the northeast of the Kalm Desert. Here the clergy have taken up the responsibility of governing and ruling a small population of people who live between the Marching Mountains and Kalm Desert. St. Tarl's Monastery is found to the north of Skamadar. Here the former villa, now turned monastery, serves as a place of education where students can come learn the basic fundamentals of various, various subjects. The monastery also houses the relics of a handful of various holy folk in the military faith. The Seminary of St. Arriven is a religious school that specializes in teaching art, covering subjects like painting, poetry, singing, and sculpture. It is the benefactor of a former noble's inheritance. These past places of worship that I described in Kalanshan were simply given an overview here. More detail can be found on each of them in the second edition source book, Empires of the Shining Sea. The Weeping Garden is a small realm that contains Ilmater's own personal serene garden. It serves as a place of healing, respite, and sanctuary for his most devout followers. No one is quite sure of its origins or true place in the multiverse, though some are quite certain it is actually some place on whichever plane Ilmeda resides on, depending on the edition. Greater details about the Weeping Garden can be found in the third edition supplement, Champions of Valor. The portal to this realm will seemingly appear before an individual in the form of a garden path surrounded by a hedge. The Monastery of the Yellow Rose, which is also known as the Citadel of the White Worm, is built on the highest peaks of the Earthspur Mountains. This monastery consists of built-up structures and several dugout catacombs located near a jagged mountain peak. Here the disciples of St. Solars the Twice Martyred toil away and live an ascetic life devoted to surviving in the harsh environment but also producing exquisite pieces of art. Here can be found the stores of their blueberry wine, burial vaults, rooms that house various art installations, and an extensive archive. Ten unnamed cloisters have been built along the roads of Tethir, intentionally placed so as to be within a day's ride from one another. The Riven Healing House is a small temple to a mater in the small town of Many Waters. This temple houses a healing pool of water that can sustain the dying, regrow lost limbs, and cure almost every disease and curse. The catch, however, is that the patient to be healed must be placed in the water wearing or with a magic item. The pool will pull the magical energy out of the item and slowly over hours use the energy to heal the patient. Some counter the belief that this healing pool is granted its powers from Ilmater. Instead, they claim that the pool holds arcane power in it, in it still from a period even long before Ilmater came to be venerated as a deity in Faerun. The Shrine of Suffering is a simple stone shrine to Ilmater in Baldur's Gate. Here, many of the city's homeless live just outside the shrine's wall. An ossuary for the dead exists beneath the shrine where the poor can pay a small fee to have a corpse interred. The ossuary backs onto the city's sewers. 
The clergy make use of the rat population from the sewers by allowing the rats to feast on the bodily remains before interring their bones. The clergy here admit that it isn't the sort of dignified end most would want, but it is the only suitable burial grounds available to the city's poor. They do their best to bring as much dignity to the procedure despite the situation. The House of the Triad in Bryn Shander is a large temple made out of stone by dwarven hands. The House of the Triad is housed by cycling clergy from three faiths of the Triad who stay on for a period of two years in this position. They typically come from Neverwinter and Waterdeep. Along the trail from Glister to Melvant is an unremarkable large pile of stones and dirt, much like others along this windswept, desolate environment. However, buried beneath the dirt is an archway that functions as a two-way portal de- dedicated to a mater. It teleports the user to various locations associated with Helm, Torm, and Tyr. The portal is only active at sunrise, high soon, which is considered noon in the Forgotten Realms, and sunset. The portal is key to only function so long as the user holds a symbol of Il Mater in their right hand and a holy symbol of one of the other mentioned gods in their left. While not exactly a place of worship, it is a place of interest to the faith. The Hand of Mercy's Children's Hospital and Orphanage in Raven's Bluff is run by Ilmatari clergy. Named temples to Ilmater include the House of the Bound Hands in the Shackles Ward of Calimport, the House of Ilmater in Westgate, the Rack of Glory in Yon, the House of Tears in Zazespur, the Convent of St. Rinda in Miratama, the Towers of Willful Suffering in Esperta, Cradle of Pain and Redemption in Raven's Bluff, and the Hospice of St. Lofsen in Waterdeep. Unnamed temples to Omater can be found in Asbraven in Twilight's Hollow. Unnamed shrines to Omater can be found in Eltrel, Berk Morden, the Abbey House of the Knights of Kaldara, Berk Morden, in Tathir, and Athkatla. Character Options For 2nd edition, the breakdown for the Pain Bearer, a specialty priest of Ilmater, can be found in the Face and Avatar supplement. An ability for Ilmatari Crusaders and the breakdown for Alleviators and a specific type of Ilmatari Priest can be found in the Warriors and Priests of the Realm supplement. For 3rd edition, the supplement Champions of Valor has a good bunch of options. The Knight Squire, the Monastery Orphan, Orphan of the Yellow Rose, and the Ward of the Triad Regional Backgrounds. The Broken Ones sacrifice psionic feet. Mark of the Triad and Paladin of the Noble Heart feet. Substitution levels for a Monk as a Broken One. Substitution levels for a Paladin as a member of the Order of the Golden Cup or as a member of the Companions of the Noble Heart. And the Triadic Knight Prestige class. In the Player's Guide to Faerun Supplement, you can find the Initiate of Illmater Feet and the Martyred Champion of Illmater Exalted Prestige class. Fourth edition, in the Forgotten Realms Player's Guide book, there is the Illmater's Martyrdom Channel Divinity Feet. As I've done in every podcast, the following is a breakdown of the features that I think someone deeply involved in Illmater's faith as an acolyte or otherwise would have for a background in 5th edition. For your two skill proficiencies, I would take medicine and religion. For your languages or tool proficiencies, I would take celestial as a language proficiency and herbalism kit as a tool proficiency. For your equipment, there's at least four options I found here that you can make use of. There's the Acolytes, of course, from the Player's Handbook, as well as the Folk Hero and Hermit, and the Cloistered Scholar from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. For those three other backgrounds from the Acolyte, easily enough, you could take the gold coins that you're given there and spend them to start off a session or a campaign with a holy symbol. For your ribbon feature attached to your backgrounds, there is the Acolyte's Shelter of the Faithful, which is found in the Player's Handbook. Uh, Also in the Player's Handbook, there's the Folk Hero's Rustic Hospitality and the Hermit's Discovery features. Then in Sword Coast Adventures Guide, there's the Cloistered Scholar's Library Access. Next is just a uh, list of subclasses for the various classes in 5th edition that I think would be thematically appropriate for a NPC or PC to take if they are a worshipper of Illmater. There's not many here that I was able to kind of pick out of what we have available to us, but 
For the cleric, there's obviously the life domain cleric from the player's handbook. For the monk, there's the open hand monk from the player's handbook. For the paladin, there is the Oath of Devotion paladin from the Player's Handbook and the Oath of Redemption paladin from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. There is the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And finally, there is the Celestial Patron Warlock found in Xanathar's Guide to Everything as well. Dungeon Master Options To start the section, we'll discuss available monsters that are given to us in 5th edition sources. In the monster manual, you have access to gold dragons, silver dragons, your three varieties of angels, which are Davos, Planetars, and Solars, as well as the stat block for the mule. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Key Ren. Next, I'll just touch on monsters that are associated with Illmater's Faith that aren't currently available to us in 5th edition sources. Stat blocks for the various tiers of Archons, Lantern, up through to Tome, can be found in various sources. Some of these include Planescapes, Planes of Law Supplement, which is a 2nd edition supplement, and the Monster Manual from 3rd edition. Anhirir, who, who might be better known to you as Anhi, Anhijar, are Celestial Warriors who fell in battle as humanoids. Of course, these Celestial Warriors might be known to you better through Norse myth, and indeed, they have a large presence in the Outer Plain of Ysgard. Don't recall any mention of them in my notes for Tyr, but this certainly would also be used by him given his Norse ties. But seemingly, Ilmater makes use of them as well. They can be found in 3rd edition's Deities and Demigods, 2nd edition's Monstrous Compendium Outer Plains Appendix and Planescape Monstrous Compendium Appendix, and finally 1st edition's Manual of the Plains. Incarnates of Courage are one variant of the incarnate creature. They are the tiny embodiment of energy surrounding an abstract concept or principle. Incarnates can be found in the planes most applicable to their concept, to the concept they are most attached to. Incarnates of courage are a neutral good in alignment. By attaching itself to a host, it abuses upon them a immunity to magical fear and gives the host a deep sense of sensible bravery. Incarnates as a whole can be found in the 2nd edition supplement Monstrous Compendium Planescape Appendix. To round out the section of monsters, the following are just a list of humanoid NPC stat blocks to represent various Ilmatari worshippers and clergy. Keep in mind with the spellcasters you can always swap out their listed spells for other spells more fitting to themes you're trying to get at. From the monster manual, there's the Acolyte, Priest, Knight, and Veteran. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the War Priest and Martial Arts Adept. From Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, there is the Frontline Medic. And finally, in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, there is the Grandmaster Halam's stat block. Now, Grandmaster Halam is a Grandmaster in the Tyran Faith, though a simple reskin can then be used to put him in the Ilmatari Faith. I put this in the wrong place in my notes, but in Baldur's Gate Descendant to Avernus, you can find the stat block for the Holy Font Celestial Creature. To round out the section for Dungeon Master options, we'll talk about magic items. The Tome of Torment is a sizable tome, and I use that term loosely, that consists of ebony plates covered in black horsehair tacked to their fronts. The tome can be unfolded to reveal a hair shirt. On the inside of this shirt are small metal barbs. After a devotee of Illmater wears the hair shirt for a day, subjecting themselves to a d4 damage, the front ebony panel of the shirt will reveal its roster of spells. By touching holy water, tears of the wearer, or the blood of the wearer to one of the listed spells, the selected spell's particulars appear on the back panel of the horse shirt. The tome has its own defenses capabilities in that it will teleport away anywhere across all of Toril if it is subjected to an attack. It is said to be one of, if not the holiest tomes in the Ilmatari faith. The current whereabouts of the tome are unknown. Over its history, it has been through the hands of rogues, priestesses of Loviatar, an eternal holy war between Ilmatari churches, only to go missing from the House of the Broken God of Keltar, in 1362 Dale Reckoning. More details in the roster of spells attached to the Tome of Torment can be found in the second edition supplement Prayers from the Faithful. The Iron Helm of Heroes is a bronze headpiece that is ordinary in appearance, 
save an etching of the holy symbol of Ilmater upon its front. This helmet is described to be a minor relic in the Ilmatari faith. Legends and stories speak to it being used across Faerun and helping to contain plagues and heal valiant heroes against the forces of evil. Where this helmet came from is truly unknown, save mention of it possibly being left over from an avatar of Ilmater who died in the lands south of the Sea of Fallen Stars. Once the magic of the helm is used up, it vanishes from Toril, though it will eventually reappear at a time when it will be of great use. The details of this helm can be found in the second edition supplement, Volo's Guide to All Things Magical. Dornavr is a holy sword forged by Ilmatari Clarasmin and enchanted by the prayers of three senior clergy members in 275 Dale Reckoning. This sword was in fact enchanted at the same location of Kimiltar, the demon Spain shield that was discussed in the last episode on Tyr. Only it was enchanted two centuries later. The sword was first entrusted to the Ilmatari Paladin Order known as the Holy Warriors of Suffering. In their hands they slew both fiends and the evil wizard who summoned these fiends to the Prime Material. From that point on it passed hands and was involved in various battles and wars against evil. Eventually, its last recorded appearance was in 1127 Dale Reckoning, where it was in the possession of the Impiltern Crown until it seemingly went missing. It is described as a bastard sword forged from an unknown alloy which gives the blade different hues. On the pommel is an etching of Ilmater's holy symbol. The blade glows blue when the presence of a demon is nearby, and it has a handful of other beneficial features enchanted on it to do battle against demons. The details of Dornavar can be found in the 3rd edition supplement Champions of Valor. A weapon enchantment first developed by the Ilmatari faith is known as Sacrificial Smiting. Weapons imbued with this enchantment allow the wielder to take a negative penalty to their level to give the wielder further access to smites than they otherwise would not have access to for a given day. This is a 3rd edition enchantment and can be found in the supplement Champions of Valor. The Hair Shirt of Ilmater is a magical piece of armor that grants a defensive bonus and access to innate healing spells. However, it causes the wearer to suffer a penalty to their dexterity. This item can be found in the 3rd edition supplement Magic of Faerun. The ribbons of the twice martyred look like the typical red bindings Ilmatari either wrap around their wrists or feet. They were once worn by a priest who waded into plague-stricken lands healing the sick and almost succumbing to the plague himself. That was until his red bindings grew in size and wrapped around him, much like a mummy. Then the priest stood up seemingly free from the disease and capable of carrying on with his efforts. Much like other Ilmatari holy items and relics, these ribbons can appear seemingly out of nowhere when a loyal follower of Ilmater finds themselves in dire straits or in a time of great need. Functionally, if the person wearing the ribbons die... The bindings will encase the wearer and fully heal them. This effect can only occur once. The details for the ribbons can be found in Dragon Magazine issue number 333. The crown of Narfal was once worn by the rulers of the evil empire of Narfal. After the empire fell, the evil artifact lie forgotten in the lower levels of a citadel. That was until the paladin Sarshal found it and shattered it in 731 Dale Reckoning. Sarshal gathered up its pieces and the high priest of the triad face took them. The pieces were reforged and the crown went on to serve as the crown of Impilter. In its reforged form, this mithril crown bears four symbols. The three respective symbols of the deities of the triad and Impilter's coat of arms. More details and a greater breakdown of the crown of Mar- Marfil and its magical abilities can be found in the 3rd edition supplement, Champions of Valor. To round out the section on magic items, I'd just like to make note of thematically appropriate magic items from official 5th edition sources. From the Dungeon Master's Guide, you have the Amulet of Health, the Book of Exalted Deeds, Bracers of Defense, the Cloak of Protection, the Elixir of Health, the Manual of Bodily Health, Necklace of Prayer Beads, Periapt of Health, Periapt of Proof Against Poison, Periapt of Wound Closure, po- the various potions of healing, potions of invulnerability, potion of vitality, ring of regeneration, the various rings of resistance, scarab of protection, scrolls of protection, staff of defense, staff of healing, 
staff is striking, and the talisman appear good. And finally, you could make use of the statuette of St. Markovia from the Curse of Strahd Adventures module, just rescanning it so it works with the Forgotten Realms. All right, thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up the release of future episodes, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. The podcast YouTube channel can be found under the title Religion in the Realms. Audio versions of the podcast can also be found on Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play Podcasts. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter handle is at Shiv's Embrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. In the next episode, we will be changing gears as we move away from the triad and take a look at Sylvanas and his allies, Myliki and Gueron Windstorm, who all are deities of nature. We have covered Eldath in the past already, and she is part of this group who does not have a name like the Triad or the Dead Three. The first episode will be on Sylvanus, the greater god of wild nature. Until next time, may Time Mora look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode, Gregorian Chant, by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.